we have four of the same question. <laughs> you can see what's uppermost on people's minds. What do you intend to do uh, in order to reduce unemployment, raise wages in a coherent fashion? La pregunta es qué piensan hacer para reducir el desempleo y subir los sueldos de una forma coherente. Pretty much the same um, question in, in all four of these. The next one is how can you improve the economy? What proposals do you have on the subject of economic development? Básicamente las seis preguntas son alrededor de lo mismo. La próxima era qué propuesta tienes en el tema del desarrollo económico en el distrito 14. We have a system devised by the League of Women Voters for the candidates to answer the questions, so it's constantly revolving, so they don't all follow each other, etc. So, question number one, which I will repeat, how can you improve the economy? What proposals do you have on the subject of economic development? And the first question would go to Nelson Sintra. We need somebody with a vision who's going to look at these 
boarded up, boarded up businesses and illegally run businesses, put them into compliance, bring in small uh, family owned businesses, mom and pop shops um, along West 25th, Clark Avenue and Scranton. I'll still continue with the 50-50 match fund. We need to use the storefront renovations and I'm told to stop. Our next question, what can you do to make the neighborhood safer? And this time we'll begin with Brian Casey. It's all I did for 10 years as the Weed and Seed Project Coordinator. I worked extremely close with both Commander McCarthy and Commander Salzler in the 1st and 2nd Districts. We did resident-based safety initiatives. Every year we took the resident-driven initiative, one year we would focus on drugs, the next year we would focus on prostitution, and the third year we would focus on curfew for individuals. I plan on continuing those and having conversations with both police commanders to take those initiatives and more wide. Um, safety in the neighborhood are, comes a lot from the residents. The stronger the neighborhood is, the safer the neighborhood is. The more involved the residents are, the safer the neighborhood will be. When residents become more involved, become eyes and ears of the, of the neighborhood and start opening their doors, turning on their porch lights and sitting on their porches, the neighborhood will become safer. Our second answer is Nelson. When I was a council, we had what was the mini stations. Mini stations did a lot of great job for us. Uh, and those little mini stations, we had to lobby to make sure that we could bring those officers because a lot of us created that bond with those officers. And we placed those mini officers in, uh, in the area. Then there was also, when Councilwoman Helen Smith was in office, on Seymour, there was a house where we had police officers stationed there it's, it's, uh, to guide where were high drug sections. We got a lot of these lengthy houses. They belong to the banks or to the city. We should be doing that in different spots throughout the community. Other things that we have done, uh, the, I know that the SWAT and, and there have been grants for officers to work together from different divisions. So we need to enforce and tell the mayor to, to make sure that we can use those officers on our street. I think the officers are doing a great job, but they need us to, to, to fund them on the council table to the finance committee and to the HUD committee to enterprise our funding and also to MPI, any of these organizations, to bring those services back into our neighborhoods. Thank you. In terms of safety, um, again, the economy's been difficult with the tax uh, revenues, and there were huge cuts in the safety forces under Mayor Campbell uh, prior to me coming to council. So it's been difficult. I'll tell you that our general approach has been to try to, to activate the, and renew the block of activity in the community. We went from eight block clubs to 30 block clubs in the last three and a half years, and they're really our eyes and ears in the street. We have two active uh, community organizers that try to organize those block clubs. I think community education as to how to use the police effectively can be very important. We have a community service unit that is not as good as Fresh Start used to be, but they are a flexible force that can crack down on nuisances. I was actually part of the legislation in writing the nuisance law to try to crack down on bad behavior of either tenants or homeowners and bad landlords. So we do a lot of work on that. We, um, as I said, we have a 50-50 program for businesses um, for potentially utilizing for safety security cameras. And we're looking to try to do what we can see what we can do with garages and alleys for residents. But we haven't figured that program out yet in terms of the money. Next question, how will you support, and um, let me just give you the order of the answers on this one. It might, might be easier for you for our candidates. Um, Brian would be first, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Cummins would be first, Mr. Casey second, Mr. Sinchon third. Okay, the question is, how will you support our community development organizations if elected? El orden va a ser el señor Cummings primero, el señor Casey segundo y el señor Cintron tercero. La pregunta es, ¿cómo van a apoyar a las organizaciones a las organizaciones si fuera este elegido? Okay. Community Development Organizations, okay. Brian's. 
Bueno, yo tengo la, la mejor experiencia de todos los candidatos sobre el desarrollo de la comunidad. Um, I have the most experience of any candidate in terms of community development. Spent over nine years in the Peace Corps working grassroots community development, working with women's groups, uh, communities, and trying to empower people. I've actually uh, was one of the three council people that put in the vision in place to create the new model of development corporations we have on the west side today. I consolidated two CDCs in the south, in the Brooklyn, and when I took office for this community, I actually took a strong organization in Detroit Sherwood and asked them to create a strong service office for this community. I have good relationships with Fremont West. They'll continue to serve the areas of Scranton Road. Um, I'm very confident in working with Tony Mercatelli in terms of uh, assisting Brooklyn Center in the Stockyards Park Fulton Brooklyn Center Community Development Office. Um, We'll, we'll continue to serve, and I think they've done a fantastic job, and you're going to be hearing more about our achievements the last three and a half years with that development corporation. Brian? Yes, Brian. Uh, as a former member of the Detroit Shore Community Development Organization, I was one of the individuals who was uh, in charge of allowing Mr. Cummings to go forward with um, the creation of the Stockyard Clark Fulton. Um, Development or Brooklyn Center Development Organization. Um, I previously sat on the board of the Community Development Organization. I think that the Community Development Organization that serves this neighborhood now is, uh, and I agree with, with Mr. Cummings, is doing a fantastic job. Uh, and I'm a very common sense type of individual. And if I believe that they're doing a fantastic job, and the residents believe that they're doing a fantastic job, we're not going to fix it. If it's not broke, we're not going to fix it. Um, as far as community development itself and the organization, the key word there, I believe, is community. Um, and bringing the community together through the community development organization is going to be a key role in this election. Again, going back to resident involvement for the community development organization to be the leader in developing the residents to become more involved is going to be extremely important. Thank you. Let me say also that I have experience also in community organizations. I said on the funding part, and it's a shame how local development corporations are graded, they're graded on performance. In areas that people do not want to develop houses, they get punished. Clark Metro was punished by the, by the administrative side, and it's, this formula has to change. Because now, I live in a Clark Fulton area, that, that services are gone. People are crying. They, they don't have the organization. They have to go all the way up to Detroit Shore. But we need to pressure NPI. We need to pressure Cleveland Foundation. In the city of Cleveland, everybody gets funding to them, but they want to fund great projects. I've been walking around the whole entire area, and I have seen decorated houses. Houses. So. That's how Park Metro got punished. If the city is not, if you're not part of that division of the city, if the city sees that that area no one wants to develop, we ain't gonna get funding. I'm not, I want to go back in there and fight and bring that funding to all local development corporations, give them the 74,000 that they serve. Our candidates are doing pretty well of uh, stopping that time, although they could do a little bit better. It does go quickly. Okay, how slow? <laughs> it does go quickly. All right. All right, our next question in the order this time will be Mr. Cintron, Mr. Cummins, and then Mr. Casey. Uh, what role do you see the faith community? Um, what role do you see the faith community in this ward? Faith communities, I should say. La orden de las preguntas van a ser para el señor Cintrón, el señor Casey y luego para el señor Cummings. La pregunta es la siguiente, ¿qué papel usted ve dentro de las organizaciones de la comunidad de fe dentro de nuestro hogar? The faith community plays a major part, regardless of what part of our heart or religion belongs to. When I was in council, I made sure that I visit every division of the clergy uh, in, this, in my ward. We had straight contacts. If, one, if there was issues going on, 
I made sure that they had my direct phone number and we were able to communicate back and forth. One thing I never did was make sure that I didn't campaign in those sections because I wanted to give the respect to, to the clergy. But out of that, I made sure that if it was a pastor, a minister, a rabbi, a, a priest, that I was able to communicate with them and my doors was always open and if there was a parishioner of that church who needed assistance, that I would have met with that, with, with that, uh, with that organization. And I believe that that is the key foundation of this community. Everybody has a faith and that faith, you know, is what makes us strong. Mr. Cummings. Thank you. Well, I have some experience in this. Um, first of all, in the Peace Corps, doing the development that I did, there's a lot of faith-based initiatives. So we worked very closely with those initiatives. Here in Cleveland, I've actually worked with the Brooklyn uh, Pastoral Association. It primarily was in the old Brooklyn and Brooklyn Center. In this community, I've been working with Pastor Omar Medina, and I want to, want to congratulate him, as well as our local development corporation. Our local development corporation has the only staff that's been funded by the Cleveland Foundation to work on weaving together some network weaver positions. Weaving together our residential concerns, business, cultural, health, education, and faith-based. So we're not only organizing, but we're actually bringing these groups together. And the faith-based community faces what our community does. An outflow of people, people that are too busy, people that are, uh, that are having difficult times in their life, and they have a problem holding and growing their churches, just like we do with our communities. So we have a very important relationship with the churches and the faith-based community, and they do most of our social services, too. All right, I'm going to be honest with each and every one of you. I'm Catholic. I had a falling out with the Catholic Church. I don't know where my faith sits right now, but I'm going to tell you now that I'm here to support each and every faith-based organization within the war. I have reached out to a number of them. Some of them reached back, some of them haven't, but I'm going to let them know that each and every one of them, and I don't care what faith they are, what nationality they serve, or who they serve, I'm here for them. Whatever they would need, I'll help provide. Especially when it comes to the social service aspect, I believe that the social service aspect should come through a lot of the faith-based organizations and not the community development organizations, but I'm here to let all the faith-based know that I'll support you. I'll just stop there. <laughs> Our next question. If elected, what do you propose to do to stop dumping within our city? De ser electo, ¿qué es lo que usted propone? De ser electo, ¿qué es lo que usted propone para detener la tirada de basura dentro de esta ciudad? I'll repeat it. If elected, what do you propose to do to stop dumping within the city? And the order this time is Mr. Casey, Mr. Centron, Mr. Collins. There was a recent story from the neighborhood where an individual was able to capture somebody who was illegally dumping. Um, and that individual, I'm not, I didn't follow the case all the way through, but I'm, I'm, were they prosecuted, Brian? You know that? You know, they are still to, to the process. It's in the, it's in the court system. Um, that was a nice and ears from a resident. Illegal dumping usually doesn't happen during the day in front of everybody during light time. It's those individuals who come through the, the back alleys at night who are dumping illegally. I would promote, again, resident involvement, getting the community involved, keeping an eyes and keeping your eyes open, watching for illegal dumping, and then reporting to 664 Dump, the councilman's office, or the second or first district police. I was one of them that passed legislation in the city council that residents are allowed to dump at ritual four times a year because they were only, they were only allowed to do it twice a year. I also put funding on the side to make sure that we did neighborhood cleanup. I made sure that it had to come out of the council budget that we were able to bring dumpsters into the community where people and neighbors were able to clean up the whole neighborhood and put the garbage inside those dumpsters. I live right behind Train Avenue, and believe me, it was a major headache for us 
and the things that I used to do is put dumpsters down Green Avenue, make sure. But the most violators that we have is not a lot of our residents. It's those private contractors that they go around and, and start dumping. I call on myself dumping um, right at uh, daylight on West 46 of Green Avenue a bunch of chambers, and we went after them. I chased them out. But again, they were not from here. They're from the outside, but it takes community involvement. It was as much detail that we were reporting to the police officers. I, I want to say that I've continued what Nelson had mentioned he did. We actually provide um, probably more than 10, 15 dumpsters a year to community groups that make sure that they use it for their community cleanups. We also use core community service. This is the issue of dealing with dumping. We also fund the development corporation with a staff person that can actually work part-time and assist with cleanups in making sure that we clean up the things that have been dumped. It is difficult. It gets back to the community engagement, the block clubs. It is the eyes and ears on the street. And um, we, we, we've also done some legislation. We've improved, the, for example, the tire disposal process where our tire shops have to register where they're disposing their tires. We're actually pushing the administration to be stronger in terms of their audits in trying to confirm, in fact, that those contracts that are on registration are actually being utilized. So it's a difficult issue, but I think we're dealing with what is dumped and we're trying to get at some of the root problems. In the audience tonight are the catchers of those dumpers, Becky and David Reeves. The next question is trash related as well, um, specifically recycling. The city laments the fact that not enough people are recycling. At the same time, the city is not implementing a citywide recycling program. They have not begun um, the program in many areas. <coughs> and I'm not sure if I'm understanding this. For too much. Oh. They haven't, uh, oh, they have begun a ticketing program um, for those that put out too much trash, but there still are areas that do not have recycling. La próxima pregunta es cómica. Dice, hablemos de la basura, específicamente reciclaje. La ciudad lamenta que no hay suficiente personas reciclando y no hay programas que sean implementados a nivel de toda la ciudad. Ha empezado a tener un programa en el que te dan tickets o penalidades a las personas que botan demasiada basura y no son suficientes reciclaje. In the order this round is Mr. Cummins, Mr. Casey, and Mr. Sutter. Well, I was in council when they initiated the waste fee, and they did it for purely a financial reason to raise money. Um, I was a lead council person that fought the administration and challenged them that if they were going to charge a waste fee, do it in a way in which they could incentivize recycling. They did listen to us. They had the supporting council to pass it in three weeks, and we have what we have today. I was also the lead opposition to the incinerator plant, the gas station plant, that they're looking at burning waste. We, When they did away with the waste uh, leaf pickup, we asked them to use our community guards for potential collection places for leaf uh, breaking down these and, and recycling them. Again, they didn't listen. We, we need the residents to speak up loudly in terms of what they want. It's taken them too long to do the recycling program. The simple incentiviz incentivization recycling is to give you a smaller black can, a bigger blue can, and give you a discount. And we've been pushing for that, but the administration refuses to do it. We think it's wrong that they're charging everybody a flat fee. As I'm walking to work, one of the biggest questions that I'm getting is, when are we going to get our recyclable cans? People have been paying for them for two years now, and they haven't reaped any of the benefits from it. The best answer I can get from City Hall is that the whole city will be recyclable by 2016. Well, some individuals will be paying for recyclable cans for five years before they even get to reap the benefits. I, to be honest with you, was not a fan of the recyclable program until we got it. And now I wish that the recyclables, the, the blue cans were bigger and the black cans of the garbage were smaller because we seem to be filling up the recyclables a lot quicker than we're filling up the garbage. 
That program needs to be a priority with the talk of the incinerator um, now. It, it can't wait. This city needs to become more recyclable prior to 2016, especially for those individuals who have been paying for the recyclable cans and not getting them. I'm here at the same thing. You know, we continue paying these fees. We don't have our garbage cans, but the city wants to continue double charging us for uh, waste collection. When I was the chairman of public service, if I was there right now, I would have put legislation, demand an audit from the plant, from the administrative side, and ask where is this money going to? Why don't we have the cans right now? And demand for legislation that the garbage cans be ordered right away. They have the money, they could have the bonds, issue bonds, and give all the residents their garbage can to go forward. As the incinerator goes, I will also put legislation in council. I don't know why members of council are delaying and giving everything to the mayor. Do the legislation. That's the power of leg the legislature. Our next question, and I'm assuming um, that this is referring to the um, happenings the other day on Seymour Avenue, um, but the question is, what is your response to Commander Sulzer's quote, see more, S-E-E-M-O-R-E, -E -E, unquote, initiative? La señora asume que la pregunta se refiere a los hechos que ocurrieron recientemente en la avenida Seymour. Uh, la pregunta es, ¿qué es tu respuesta a la respuesta del señor comandante Sosser en la iniciativa Seymour, que traduce en español ver más, pero se usa en coherencia con el nombre de la calle Seymour? En our order at this time is Mr. Cintron, Mr. Cummins, Mr. Casey. You know, I think we should be asking the commander for this question, telling us, for us to speak on his behalf is, is wrong. And, uh, and I don't think that I should comment on the commander. You know, if we want to, let's bring the commander over and tell us what he meant for Seymour. Well, as, as a councilman for this ward, I'm fully aware of what Seymour is. Uh, the commander, first of all, for those who don't know, the commander was a lead investigator um, on the missing women's case that was broke. Made. So he, he's taken it very close to heart in terms of what he can do as a commander now. He was actually an investigator when those cases occurred 10 years ago. So what he's done is he's had to call for a Seymour um, initiative in which he is committed in, in issuing and in, in activating activities within the community to draw more attention to our missing persons cases. It's a very difficult issue because even one of the news stations now is flashing missing persons that have only been missing a month. Unfortunately, or fortunately, 95% of the missing cases are solved. It's a small 5% that go on beyond the year that are the most difficult. And the commander is trying to bring attention to that. And I think the community is being responsive. I've known Keith Salzer since I've been 17 years old. And I knew him when he was a sergeant in the 1st District when the girls went missing. And I know that he took it to heart very much. And I think that his Seymour comment is not a derogatory comment. I know Keith, and I know what he meant was if you see something, say something. He wants more resident eyes and ears out there to be involved. I'll take the stand and say that if... It's a very difficult thing, Seymour Avenue, because of the emotion behind it. But 10 years is a very long time for residents to live next to something that tragic that's going on and to not be able to see something. I know that Keith was not disrespectful when he said it. I know that he's a very heartfelt individual, and I know that I stand behind him, where if you see something, you say something. You become more involved. And the more involved the residents are, the more you call the police, the more you, you talk things up, the safer the neighborhoods will be. Next question. Um, the ward is changing because of absentee landlords. 
where do you stand on code enforcement and on code enforcement of absentee landlords? Nuestro lugar está cambiando debido a los propietarios de propiedades que están ausentes, los dueños de casas ausentes. ¿Dónde usted se para en el, sobre el código de enforzamiento en contra de los propietarios de propiedades ausentes? En el orden de answer, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cintron, Mr. Collins. Absentee landlords can be good, but we also know that absentee landlords can be the downfall to a whole neighborhood. I was just meeting with the resident before we got here and he asked me that exact same question. I worked with Judge Bianca for many years now and I know that when elected, starting January, we will have quarterly meetings to educate absentee landlords on how to better screen their tenants. Those, that, those absentee landlords who refuse to participate in the education of screening your tenants, working in conjunction with community policing and Commander Salzer, we're going to put together an initiative that will hit them in a way that they've never been hit before. I.e., the police have the ability to give tickets for tall grass and weeds, can give tickets for chip paint, for housing code violations. If I'm elected or when I'm elected, we're going to start initiating that on the absentee landlords. Mr. Sintran. I think there's more than just absentee landlords. You know, when I was a city council, all houses that were rental property had a register with the city of Cleveland. It was just access for us to know who, who those houses belongs to. But it's going beyond that. You know, I have seen uh, property owners fix the house beautiful, but then people who rent the houses and trash those houses also. So it's a double sided edged sword. True, we need to have strong code enforcement but we need to make sure that the funding for that division in the city of Cleveland gets funded properly. Talking to the suspectors when we used to have the meetings, those are the divisions that get caught every budget season. Every budget time, those inspectors get less and less money. We need to make sure when the budget time comes around, if you, whoever wins, that, the, that division is funded. Not to the local development corporation, but to have the inspectors are there. We don't need the local development corporation doing our inspector jobs. Mr. Cummings. Okay, well, in, in fact, the development corporation is in partnership. There's something called the Code Enforcement Partnership with the city of Cleveland. Um, part of the problem with code enforcement is the culture of the inspectors of the city of Cleveland. Um, I will want to give credit to our development corporation and the housing community in particular. Uh, just related to the amount of demolitions we've been able to do, we were ranked 15th, 16th out of 19 wards. We're up in the top three for the amount of demos we received. I think the housing committee in discussions understands that although we've done very good on demolitions, we need to somehow figure out how to be stronger in terms of our enforcement, uh, particularly where it comes to absentee landlords. Unfortunately, we tried to drive the program for code enforcement through the partnership. It's been active now for about three years. But unfortunately, too often the inspectors drive their own priorities and they don't listen to the community. The reason why we think that the block clubs are so important is that you can know through your own eyes and ears what are the priorities. And we have a list of, of landlords. We know who they are. We've been very effective with some of them, but it takes a lot of work and we've made a lot of progress. Next question. Street maintenance is a huge issue in this ward. You might add in the city, period, um, in Ward 14. We have sinkholes, metal plates, and uh, potholes. What's your plan to solve this problem? El mantenimiento de nuestras carreteras y calles es un gran issue en nuestra comunidad, en nuestro ward, el número 14. La señora dice que yo creo que es en la ciudad entera que tenemos un problema con nuestros hoyos en las carreteras. Tenemos hoyos, tenemos metales levantados, tenemos... Básicamente las calles son un desastre. ¿Cuál, cuál es su plan? En el orden para este round es Mr. Cummins, Mr. Casey, Mr. Sintra. Es una 
difficult issue from the standpoint, again, it's tied to the revenue of the city. Because tax receipts are down, we're not able to bond sufficient money to actually do road repairs. Since being in council for seven and a half years, they actually took the money away from us, from council, for two, two of those seven years. And we've been behind about half the amount of roads that we used to pay for the last seven years. So it's been very difficult. We put some pressure on the administration. Finally this year, they're going to be doing crack seals. What happens is when the roads start to crack and open up, that gets larger and larger and even causes more problems. We've been doing, because we have less money, you've been seeing more and more patches that are occurring, 10 feet by 30 foot patches. We're also trying to put more pressure on the administration to inspect utility cuts. When they cut the roads and they don't fill them properly, those cuts end up um, being in very bad shape in two or three years. So these are some very basic road repair problems that we're trying to force the administration to deal with, and they finally are beginning this year. City Council gets $220,000 a year allocated for road repair. First, we need to recognize the problem. The problem is that we're using cold patch, and we live in the city of Cleveland, and one day it's 90 degrees, and the other day it's 30 degrees. Cold patch doesn't work. What we need to do is take that money away from City Council, give it back to the city, have them bond the money out, working with the state and federal dollars to match the money. The, the, one of the problems with the money coming to the city council first, and, and all three of us have to agree on it, is that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So what happens when the money stays with council is that those who are loudest get their streets done first. If the money goes back to the city to have them match the grants with federal or state local dollars, have the city responsible for taking care of the streets as opposed to the council um, allocating what streets get done, we're going to be much better off. We also need to hold our own public utilities as well as private utilities more responsible for doing the job that they need to do when they're done digging up our streets and actually patching it back the right way. I guess I, when I was in council, I was the king of land because I had all the adders from Ohio City all the way up to the uh, Clark Fulton area. And one of the things that I did is I used the bond dollars and I used the hot dollars. Hot dollars have allowed us to do streets and sidewalks, curbs. But the problem is not here. It is we have a weak council. And when I was in council, we were a, a strong council. When Helen was in council, there was a strong council. We passed the legislation, we passed the budget. Mayor just submit the budget to us. It is our responsibility to decide where that money is going to go to. If we accept and allow the mayor to spend all the money on his way, we ain't going to do nothing in the neighborhood. You don't see no patches in downtown, but we see it in, in our neighborhoods. So let's put, let's start using our powers legislators. Let's put that legislation in. When it comes into the finance moment, you know, if the mayor take that budget out, that was part of the negotiation between council, council president, and the mayor. No, are you taking that money away from my budget? Well, we're going to take it from this point because we want our streets done in our, in, throughout the city of Cleveland. It's the only way of doing it. It is the budget. Our next question, what do you see as the major issues of seniors living in the ward. Nuestra próxima pregunta es cuánto debe ser el issue mayor que sufren nuestros comunidad envejeciente que viven dentro del ward. And our order this time is Mr. Centron, Mr. Cummins, Mr. Casey. High cost utilities. Every time we look around, members of council is raising the water bills, more garbage, rates are going up. Uh, seniors don't know what kind of benefits they have on their hand because of lack of communication. You know, um, we have a lack of council. You know, and, and, and it's a shame. There's a senior program out there. Why is there more communication going after our seniors? It is our job to make sure to identify where our seniors are at. We got a voting list. That voting list tells us because if you get a little birthday card from politicians to happy birthday, they know when your birthday is at. Okay? So why can't we identify those leaders, I mean our seniors, and, so, and reach out to them? 
That's our job. Let's have let's get back into common sense. We have to start passing laws that benefit the people. Not the mayor's agenda. It is the people's agenda. And that's what I'm looking for. Well, first of all, um, I'm working right now, right now, um, leading an initiative to assist particularly seniors who will no longer be receiving checks for Social Security. So we're actually looking at um, working with a nonprofit organization to help reach seniors that need banking facilities. And we're, we're, we've already worked with credit unions and banks, particularly for earned income tax credits, so that, that people can actually get money back that's due to them if they're lower incomes. Seniors are on fixed incomes, and we're going to be um, mapping the banks and the credit unions to make sure that when they lose their Social Security check, that no longer comes, that they can find free banking services to help them. In addition, I just want to put a plug out. We have a director from the Westside Community House. That area is going to be within part of Word, well, part of Word 14 in the new year. We also have Senior Citizens Resources Center, as well as the Hispanic Senior Center, that we currently work with to ensure they're serving our seniors. We've also contracted, the city's contracted with the Senior Connection Transportation, the Senior Transportation Connection, to assist with transportation for seniors to ensure that they get to their appointments and their shopping. Well, the seniors are who paved the way for us to be here now. Um, and we've met a lot of seniors, and a lot of those seniors have quality of life issues. They don't want to do anything but just live out the remainder of their days in peace and quiet. Um, and I believe that helping them with quality of life issues so that they're not sitting around for safety issues, wondering if they're going to be able to get robbed going into the nearest Aldi's, which is another issue that we can discuss later, um, or um, transportation. So I'm going to be committed to a lot of assuring residents that they'll be safe in their community by having more resident involvement and transportation. All right, um, Ward 14 has a number of thoroughfares, major streets that cut through it. What would you do with the major thoroughfares in the neighborhood? West 25th, Fulton, West 41st, 44th, 65th, Clark, and Denison. In one minute, or that's, that's a big question. <laughs> Go ahead, John. So Ward tiene un número de carreteras principales, avenidas principales, en nuestro vecindario, tal vez como la West 25, la 25 Este, la Fulton, la 41 y 44 Este, la 65 Este, Clark y Denison. ¿Qué piensan hacer con esas calles? And the order for this round is Mr. Casey, Mr. Centron, Mr. Collins. First thing I do with 41st and 44th is get a paint. We would definitely have a much smoother ride through the ward if we deal with the the, the, the street repairs that need to be done. Like I said uh, uh, before, West 25th is a goal line. It's an absolute goal line. My vision for West 25th would be to put people back on the street. You have over 10,000 people a day that come in and out of Metro Hospital, and there's very little for them to do around Metro Hospital. My vision may not take four years, it may not take eight years, but I know I was a part of West 65th in Detroit when I was on the board down there, and we know that that took many, many years. We know that Camp's Corner development took many, many years. At least I have a vision, and it's something that I want to see come through no matter who was elected. West 25th has to stop, for lack of a better term, being ghetto. Mr. On our commercial Main Avenue, look at how we could make major development on the streets. On the residential side, which are main arteries, to make sure there's strong port enforcement. But also to look at the pattern of traffic. One street, you'd be driving 25 miles per hour. The other street, you're at 35 miles per hour. And, and we have to have that study happen now. When I was in council, Ohio City had plans of making some of the certain main arteries one way, one way, and the other one all the way to the other side. I feel that council 
that went blank. Every time you want to do something, we put the money, we do the study, but it goes into a file and never gets developed. We need to get all the residents engaged in whatever is residential, find out which is the best way. If it's the best way to lower the speed up, uh, is it better to make it a one-way street? But you start engaging that kind of dialogue where our main arteries go from point A to point B. Mr. Thank you. First of all, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're actually looking, um, we are actually contracting with the safety director to place cameras at the intersections at 25th and Clark, Denison and Pearl, Fulton and uh, Dennis, Fulton and Denison, and then Clark and Fulton. So the four primary intersections of the current word. I'm in discussions with Councilman Zone to look at a uh, camera somewhere, potentially at 65th and Store. We'll be talking with the folks in Stockyards about that potential. They'd like to actually do that this year with these other cameras. And we're also looking uh, at, at uh, Denison closer to Ridge. For major arterials, I actually initiated the West 25th Street Initiative three years ago. Got the neighbor Progress Inc., Councilman Kelly, Councilman Zipperman, with large foundation support to try to do something with a remake of the weakest section of West 25th Street. I've met with uh, the new CEO president in Metro Health. There's going to be a half billion dollars invested in Metro Health. So West 25th Street is going to be looking very different in five years. I'm going to play a major role 